Yeah. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm pretty anxious about this message for about two weeks now. <clears throat> just thank the Lord for the message, and um, He certainly blessed me in preparing, and I just pray He bless it to your ears here this morning. The, the message is titled, The Tree of Life, and that is, the tree of life is the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. There's three points to the message. Uh, point one is eyes opened into death. That's where when we fell in Adam, uh, their eyes were opened, as Rick just read, and they feared death, and they performed iniquity, false covering. The second point is eat of the tree of life and live forever. The gospel message is right in Genesis, right after the fall. As Rick read, eat of the tree of life and live forever. This is Christ. He is the tree of life, and we're grafted back in to Christ based on his work alone. And the third point this morning is our eyes are open then, after Christ's work, our eyes are open into life. And then we fear God. And the fear of God is to give glory of salvation 100% to God Almighty. That is actual true fear, true fear of God. So the first point being eyes open into death we read in Genesis here, what happened after the fall? Right, right away, their eyes were opened in verse 7. <clears throat> the eyes of them were both opened. They knew that they were naked. There's a big difference, wasn't there? <laughs> Before, everything was taken care of. As, uh, as last message, Sunday morning, everything was supreme. Awesome. At this point, big problem, naked. First time they saw, we got a big problem here. We got, to, we got to cover this. They sewed fig leaves together. That's iniquity. That's trying to do something to cover your guilt. And they heard the voice of the Lord and the walking in the cool of the garden, just like he did every day, to teach them the gospel and preach the gospel to them. They ran and hid. They're afraid now. Total different situation after the fall. Fear was driving them. Their eyes were opened into fear of death. Rightfully so. God's decree was that if you've if you're not perfect, there's sure death. And that's what they said no to. They said, no, nope, we got a better way. We like Satan's message. Satan's message was, we're not going to die. And that actually through this rebellion, we can become like gods. So it was a win-win, this rebelliousness. God's decree was just the opposite, and that's what fell upon them right at this point. They realized they're naked. They started doing iniquitous, abominable acts against God to say there's another way I can... I can start making things right again by my own actions. And this is what every one of us are born into. In Hebrews, God couples sin and iniquity together. He says he's going to remember it no more based on the work of Christ. But he couples sin, that original sin of Adam, and the iniquity that we see here in Genesis where they put fig leaves together. That's your personal act that you hate God. That you're going to do something to cover your sin. You're going to do something to cover your guilt that doesn't have anything to do with Christ's righteousness. It has to do with your supposed righteousness. That iniquity, God's going to remember no more. In Hebrews 10, 17, if you want to look at that later, it's a precious passage that he's not going to remember that anymore. But you got to remember, sin and iniquity are coupled together in the fall. That's the problem. We fell in Adam, and we started doing iniquitous acts. And everybody that's ever been born, except for the Lord Jesus Christ himself, do iniquitous acts that have to be reconciled. God hates them. By one man, sin entered into the world, says in Romans 5, 12, and death by sin, so that death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. We're all guilty in Adam, every single one of us. <clears throat> right away, there was iniquity. Why does man work so hard to cover nakedness? Because of the fear of death. The consciousness of man is, I'm going to perish. We have that consciousness built in from the fall. Doing something assuages that for a little bit of time. And it's, it's wickedness, it's hate for God. The iniquitous is to say, I don't need Christ, I'm going to do it myself. But it's all as we know from our birth, from conception, we're born in death. We're conceived in iniquity, born in death. But our eyes open into death, we have a spirit that says we're full of slavery. That's in Romans 5.15. For 
ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. The spirit of bondage is that spirit, that inner conscience or guilt that says, I got to do something. The third, the second thing that happens in this eyes open and to death is that you're a slave. In Hebrews 2.15, he says, and deliver them who are through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. The word bondage in Greek means slavery. We're enslaved to the fear of Adam, the fear of the fall, the fear of death. And in 1 John 4.18, the third thing that comes out of the fall is torment. Torment means to punish. So there's three things in the in eyes being opened unto death that Adam and Eve went through in the garden at that point in time. And every one of us go through until God saves us, until he opens our eyes into life. We go through the spirit, the inner conscience of guilt. We're a slave to it to do and to do more and to do more because the guilt comes back again. we got to do more. And there's just punishment. It's just more guilt and it's a continuous process of over and over again. This is why believers don't punish our children. Punishment is tormenting. All you do is go back to more guilt, more disobedience, more hate towards God to have no reconciliation and have more guilt and come back again to do it over and over again. It's slavery. It's working to just perish. We don't punish our children. We correct them. We love them and teach them and correct them with what God's word says. There's two types of seeds that were in Adam when he fell. Two types of seeds. One elect and one not elect. <clears throat> After salvation, the elect, like Abel, take comfort and stock in someone else's death. Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. In Ephesians 1, 4, he says, According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, he chose a particular people, God the Father, chose a particular people before Christ spoke the world into existence and placed us inside his dear son Jesus. These, after salvation, see that it's Christ's work that saves them. And Abel lived that out. And we're not going to turn to it, but Abel, by faith, offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Cain's sacrifice was hate to God. Abel's was another died in my place. And I'm going to rest all my soul consciousness. <laughs> my consciousness is clear now that I'm resting on this one that died for me. And that's the one I'm going to rest in. But the non-elect, they're, they're never going to be saved. And they die resting on their own works. And that's Cain. The picture of Cain and all of mankind after Cain is the non-elect. Cain brought of the fruit of the ground and offered unto the Lord. Fruit of the ground? That's not what God preached. That's not the message of Christ's work. That's the message of man's work. That's Satan's work. That's Satan's message. The work of man to satisfy a guilty conscience can do nothing for man. But it's what the non-elect die believing. And that's why they're so offended in the gospel that says, it's been done for you. It's all over with. They don't want that message because their own works is what cures their guilty conscience. And they can't rest on Christ's work. They have to rest on their own. They're not given to rest on Christ's work. But both the non-elect and elect died in Adam. The elect fell in Adam because we were in great stead. We fell in Adam, died in Adam. The non-elect died in Adam. There's no hope for them. Both are born into this life from their mother thinking there's something I can do to save myself. There's a work I can do to where I can be equal with God and I'm building my own argument, my own custom argument to try to fight with God and say I'm good enough for heaven. He's not going to have it. He's not going to have anything to do with it. The true in, herein is true evil. In Genesis 3, 5, Satan's message to Eve, then your eyes shall be open and you shall be as gods, knowing good and even evil. You're going to be a god is true evil. The love of anything other than Christ is true evil. He says in the New Testament, uh, the, uh, the root of all evil is the love of money. The love of money is anything other than Christ. Anything that you value monetarily that's better than Christ and, and is supreme other than Christ that's the root of all evil. And this is the message of the root of all evil, that your eyes will be open you should be as gods. Their eyes weren't open into being God. Their eyes were open into death, into darkness, into corruption, into sin, into trying to do something to save themselves, which is 
you can't accomplish anything. It's only slavery. So if you want to save yourself, it's in Genesis. The outcome, torment, sorrow and conception, sorrow and birthing. You got to report to your husband. He's going to rule over you. Your husband, the men are going to be cursed. The, the ground's going to be cursed for your sake. You're going to work every day of your life until you die. That's it. You think you're going to save yourself? That the end's just torment of a life. It's 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 just death. True salvation is in verse 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. He's telling Satan at that point that my son is going to stomp your head for my people. He's going to conquer death and stomp you out of my people's lives. The Gospels also in 21. Look here. Unto Adam also and to his wife. What a loving action God did right then. Lord God made coats of skins and clothed them. It wasn't so fun for the animal off to the side that God slaughtered in their place and clothed their nakedness, their rebellious, their wickedness was covered with an innocent animal's skin. That's the picture of the Lord Jesus Christ slaughtered and slain in your place if you're ever to come to know him savingly. But the but the third gospel message in the proclamation from God to Adam and Eve in the fall, right here, is the one I want to expand. And it's in verse 22. Take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. God told them right there in the, in the, in the uh, garden, there's a tree of life. The Lord Jesus Christ is that tree of life. And that's the second point. Eat of the tree of life and live forever. There's eternal life in Christ's righteousness, Christ's work, Christ's actual doing and dying for you. In Exodus 15, there's the first example that I found in studying for this message where the tree is shown. Christ is the tree. They were, you remember the story, they're walking the wilderness wanderings and they came upon this lake that was bitter. And the children of Israel complained against Moses and Moses intervened and went to the father and said what am i to do this is this water's bitter and god said take this tree and throw it in the water and he did that's a picture of christ being cast into hell for you cast in and take your bitterness what you deserve what happened to the water turn it sweet as can be total res total reunion with the Father again is what Christ accomplished. But he's that tree that was thrown into that lake in your place. Psalm also, he says, And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. Salvation is his, not man's. And he brings it about in his time. 2014 years ago, that was his time. He brought his son right out of this earth, born of a virgin, lived in your place, was resurrected, showing he's completely accepted. His leaf shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. He is prosperous. His work was resurrected, shown, approved by the Father, and is your hope right now. And then in your outline, I put the two passages from Ezekiel 17 and Hosea 14. He's the goodly cedar in Ezekiel 17. In the mountain of the height of Israel will I plant it. And it shall bring forth bows and bear fruit and be a goodly cedar. This is the Lord Jesus Christ in the picture of a tree. And under it shall dwell all fowl of every wing. He's going to save, he's going to save of all races. There's elect from the four corners of the world. And in the shadow of the branches thereof shall, he dwell, shall they dwell. The elect are going to be in the cleft of the rock. We're going to be in the shadow of Christ. Christ is going to crawl up on that cross. He's going to die in our place, and we're going to be in the shadow of him. We're going to be protected. He's going to absorb all the wrath of the Father. We won't receive any of it. We're going to be completely made whole by his work alone, not ours. Hosea 14, 6 says the same thing. His branches shall spread. His beauty shall be as the olive tree, and his smell as Lebanon. He, he's the God of God. He's the one to look to. He's awesome. They dwell under his shadow. They that dwell under his shadow shall return. They're going to be returned to goodness, returned as before the fall. They shall revive as the corn and grow as the vine. Anybody in Christ, in that process of him dying on the cross, 
has been returned back before the fall and brought whole again. The amazing thing in meditating on this message is that the sun wasn't even out during the torment of Christ on the cross. Those three hours he was on the cross absorbing the wrath for his people, God the Father's wrath, the only shadow there was was under Christ from the direction of God the Father pouring out his wrath. There's not even a human physical shadow. This is in the shadow of Christ. He's talking about being under and in Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, while he is absorbing all that wrath and hate of the Father for you. He absorbed every ounce of it. There's none left. He accomplished it all. Turn to Romans chapter 11 with me, please. Romans chapter 11, talking about Christ being the tree of life. Romans chapter 11, verse 24, For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? Now, this is Paul preaching and teaching that in giving encouragement to the Jews, you'd be grafted right back in. Gentiles are being grafted into Christ. He's the olive tree. He's the one of life. And he and God's grafting in people into Christ. How much easier is it just to graft in those that were originally his? But I'm not going there. I'm going to go to 26. And so all Israel shall be saved. Every single one of God's elect are going to be grafted back into Christ based on his work. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, the Lord Jesus Christ, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. The Lord Jesus Christ took your sin on himself on the tree and completely absorbed the wrath of the Father. Your sins are gone now. He accomplished salvation for you. And in that, you were grafted back into himself. Yes, you fell in Adam, devastated, separated from God. So much so, you're just like the non-elect. Come out of your mother hating God, wicked, trying to cover your own sin by more sin, by more hate for God. But God in his love for you grafted you back into Christ based on Christ's work alone. So, turn to Revelations 2 with me. I'm going to blow your mind. In Genesis, we talked and read about the tree of life and live forever. Eat of the tree of life and live forever is what God preached to Adam and Eve right there in the garden. And look at what he says in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 7. And he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Christ has been resurrected. He's right in the midst of the paradise of God. And he is that tree of life that gives life to his people. Here he is again. From Genesis to Revelation, Christ is the tree. And the word overcometh in this verse 7 is a powerful word. That word overcometh, I looked it up. It means to pl plate together, P-L-A-I-T, to plate together. That word means to weave together. It also means formally. So this is, we're woven together in Christ like before the fall. We're returned back again. We're woven back based on Christ's work. The elect are made righteous in the person and by the works of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're woven back into him from his work on the cross for us. He took our sin. In Christ's life, every step of obedience, we're being woven back into him. We fell in Adam and we're haters of God. Woven back in based on Christ's righteous life. Every step to the cross that Christ took, we're being woven back in to Christ. Every blow of the Father's wrath, we were being woven back into Christ. Every drop of Christ's precious blood, woven back into him. Every step to the mercy seat with his holy blood, we are being woven back into Christ. Every prayer to the Father, 
woven back into Christ. Every step towards Satan in hell, woven back into Christ. Every stomp on Satan's head, woven back into Christ. Every latitudinal change being lifted back up to the Father out of hell after stomping Satan's head, woven back into Christ. And the breath of the Holy Spirit into you in this life, woven back into Christ. It's Christ's work that overcame and wove you back into him, grafted you back into the tree as before the fall. Yes, you fell in Adam, but Christ accomplished it all. You're returned back, and now your eyes are opened. Point three, your eyes are open. What happens when a believer goes through the process and your eyes are open? Ezekiel 36, 31 says it best. Then shall ye remember your own evil ways. You're going to know that you and your ways are evil because Christ has been revealed to you. The Holy Spirit's been put in you, and you see now. You actually have your eyes opened to life. They were open to death. Now your eyes are open to life. All your doings that were not good, not good, and shall you loathe yourself in your own sight for your iniquities and your abominations. All that you thought you did to save yourself was evident token you were doomed. God saved you from that. Now you see what it is. It's behind you and it's filth. It's hate for God. You see who Christ is and you worship him alone. Your eyes are now open to life. Turn to Isaiah 41 with me, please. Isaiah 41. I'm going to start reading at verse 8. But thou, Israel, art my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen. You're elect. If you're saved, you're elect. You're chosen. The seed of Abraham, my friend, thou whom I have taken from the ends of the earth and called thee from the chief men thereof and said unto thee, thou art my servant. I have chosen thee and not cast thee away. The elect have not been cast away. They, we fell in Adam, but Christ came and saved us back. We've been woven back into Christ. Fear thou not. Don't go the way of fear. See what it is. It's hate for Christ. It's to say, I can save myself. Don't fear anymore. There's no fear left. I love you, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. My righteousness is what saves you, not your works. Don't fear anymore. Behold, all they that were incensed against, me, against thee shall be ashamed and confounded. They shall be as nothing, and they shall strive with thee, shall perish. Thou shalt seek them, and shalt not find them, even them that contended with thee, they that warred against thee, shall be as nothing and as a thing of naught. Your sin, your self-righteousness, all the things that conquered you and beat you down before salvation, they're all gone now. Every one of your enemies, even your own wicked conscience that said, I got to do more, it's all gone. You're made new in Christ. You see now who God is. For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand. He's tenderly holding your hand right now. Saying unto thee, fear not, I'll help thee. It's my work of righteousness. It's the Lord Jesus Christ that saves and that does all the work of salvation, not your work. Fear not, thou worm Jacob, and ye men of Israel. I will help thee, saith the Lord, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, who saves, not a worm. A worm is, is a maggot in the Old Testament. This worm that he calls Jacob is a maggot. It was born in death. It lives in death. It, it knows nothing but death. Its nutrition is death. That's the fall of Adam. That's iniquity. And that's what God saved Adam out of. That's what God saved Jacob out of. And that's what God saved you out of. Turn to John 15, please. We're going to see what eyes opened yields the believers. God does it. We, we can't open our own eyes. We're just a maggot. Hebrews chapter, did I say? John 15. John 15, verse 7. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you. When God puts his Holy Spirit in you, his words are in you. you 
Your eyes are open. Ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. You're going to say, save me. I'm a wicked wretch. Right away, you're going to say, "My all I've ever done is evil. All I've ever done is iniquity. I'm, I hate God, and that is where I'm at right now. That is eyes opened into life. And you're going to ask right when he gives you the Holy Spirit, save this wretched soul. All I've ever done was iniquitous works against Christ. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit. The much fruit is asking for salvation when he gives you a new heart and new eyes to see. The other one is to fear God. He causes his people to fear him. And look at the definition of fearing God. I've got it in your outline. The strongest definition that I found was in Revelation 14.7. He says in Revelation 14.7, Fear God and give glory to Him. This is fear of God. The glory of salvation is ascribed to God alone. This is eyes open unto life. What you used to believe is your own work saved you. That's evil. That's sin. That's wickedness. That's a waste of time. That's hate for Christ. Now my eyes are open. All the glory to God Almighty. It's Christ's works that saves me. This is fear of God. Turn to Hebrews 12, please. God's going to shake up everything. He says here in brief uh, that... that uh, he shook the world once, but he's going to shake the heavens and the world. You can read that later, Hebrews 12. But I'm going to start here in just one verse in verse 28, Hebrews 12, 28. Wherefore, are we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved? Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and with godly fear. The reverence and godly fear with eyes open unto God, is to say he alone saves. There's no other means of salvation other than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. This is reverence, respect for God. He's holy. He's the only one that can save. And it's true salvation. This is true repentance. A, a, a repentant sinner says, I've been turned from my own works. Salvation that was a waste of time. And I've been turned to the Lord Jesus Christ as my only means of salvation. Romans 9, 21 says, Hath not the potter power of the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? It's God's business to give these new eyes, this new heart, to whoever he wants. He can make some unto dishonor and they'll perish in hell throughout eternity. They'll never know that Christ comes savingly. But then those that are elect, they're gonna, we're going to come to know them. This being turned from death to life, eyes open from death to eyes being open to life, is God's decision alone. It's his, it's, he's the only one with free will that can save, that does save. In Isaiah 64, it says that God's the potter, with, our, with us is the clay. But now, O Lord, thou art our father. We are the clay, and thou art the potter, and we all are the work of thy hands. God made every one of us. He's sovereign over every one of us, and he'll do with us what he wants. If he wants to break one to the ground and torment us throughout hell and throughout eternity, he'll do it. If he wants to save us by his grace, he'll do it. Turn to Jeremiah 18. Jeremiah 18 explains this boldly. This is the original event of the preacher that God told to go watch a potter. I'm going to I'm going to minister unto you and show you who I am. And he does it in Jeremiah 18. The word which came to Jeremiah, Jeremiah 18, 1, said, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the, on the wheels. Now you know that a potter has a wheel that they kick that's circular, that is, has enough energy and momentum to keep spinning, but you got to kick it every now and then and spin it. And they're spinning these pots with clay, and um, as the wheel spins around, you can form the pot into a usable shape. That's exactly what this prophet was observing here. And the vessel that he made, verse 4 of clay, was marred in the hand of the potter. So it got lopsided and had flaw in it. 
So what did he do? He started over and made it a vessel that seemed good to the, pos the potter. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. The elect fell. We were marred. We were a marred pot. God's decision was to do that. His will that we would fall in Adam. You know what? He restored us in his own hands with his, the hands of his son Christ. He restored us back to a vessel that's usable and good and right based on Christ's work and his righteousness. But the, the reprobate is in verse 7. What, at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it? God's saying, if I want to take that clay of a whole nation and damn it to hell, I, that's my business. My people, they're marred, and, but I'm going to restore them back through Christ's work. Everybody else, away with you. It's just God that saves. It's His work. And this is true fear of God to say, you alone can save and you alone do save. And I'm bound to that because you gave me a heart to see it, to see what I am, and see who you are. And this is true repentance. Mm. Proverbs... There's many places in Proverbs about evil. <clears throat> There's many places in Proverbs about the fear of the Lord, is what I meant to say. The fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord is intense. There's so many awesome outcomes of saying and knowing that God saves who he wants. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord prolongeth days. The fear of the Lord is strong confidence. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. Everybody's looking for the fountain of life. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. If you fear God, if you know and you ascribe all credit of salvation to Christ alone, you've hit the fountain of life. You're it. You're in it. You've been washed by his blood and you're clean and you have eternal life in him. By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged, and by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. We depart from evil when God gives us knowledge that he alone saves, and it's his business of salvation. Proverbs 19.23 was probably the most powerful when I was studying through this. There's three things in Proverbs 19.23. Study it out. The fear of the Lord tendeth to life. The fear of the Lord is eternal life. You see now. He's my salvation. Christ is my salvation. The fear of the Lord satisfies. That guilty conscience that you used to have to fight with every day, gone. You fear God now. You say, all righteousness, all credit of salvation is God's alone. You're satisfied. You don't walk around fearful anymore. And the third thing is, the fear of the Lord, the Lord you won't be visited with evil anymore. There's going to be no more evil in your life. Christ stomps Satan's head. Evil will not come back to you. You will never go back to thinking you can justify yourself and you'll be your own God. It's not going to happen. You won't walk away. You can't walk away. So the use of this message here this morning, uh, came coming out of the scriptures with make your coin election sure, I thought it was very fitting. If you're dead in your sins still yet, you're full of evil. You think you can save yourself. However, if you're alive in Christ, His works, His faith, keep you and save you. And that's the fear of the Lord, all glory and honor to God and salvation.